Hey guys, Jonathan here at Night Knowledge. Today's video is on the Fallout board game. I found there weren't enough good videos that showed what the game was about, and I wanted to quickly show you so you can determine whether you'd be interested in purchasing it. So let's get right into it. So this is what it looks like with everything out in the open. It is a lot of pieces and a lot of unique pieces and um, not a good way to organize it. It comes with a nice uh, flavor standby uh, insert, which I removed from the box because it wasn't going to fit nicely with it in there. So the Fallout board game is a story driven one to four player competitive game, which puts the player in the Fallout universe. To win the game, the player must accumulate X amount of influence points before your opponents and before a certain faction becomes too strong. We'll talk about the influence points a little later in the video. I'm going to set up the board and we'll be right back. So while the host sets up the board, players will choose their uh, characters or their classes. Uh, we have here on the left the uh, Brotherhood Outcast and on the right the Vault Dweller. Uh, what people do is they grab their figurine, they grab three caps each uh, denoted by the red cap, they'll grab their character card right here, and they'll grab one agenda card each. They'll keep those secret. Uh, those will, as we, we'll talk about that later, but they give you influence points. You'll grab one of these small uh, special cards. Um, when you flip them over, they tell you where you're supposed to put them. So your character board's right here. So if I was the Brotherhood Outcast, I would put the eye intelligence in the eye area right here. And um, then I would take the flip over the card, which is the uh, Brotherhood um, T45 power armor. And that is an armor slot. So that goes right here on the left hand side. Okay, and we're back now. Uh, so as we can see here in front of us, we have the board set up. Uh, there are, I guess, scenario cards right here. There's about, I think, four or five of them, and they will tell you how to set up the board. So as you can see in the top left, we have Crossroads Camp. We have Diamond City in the middle with the CIT ruins. And in the bottom right, which I forgot in my first playthrough, you have uh, Downtown Boston, as well as the railroad. Uh, so it tells you how to set up the game. It tells you uh, you have to have stage uh, 014 in terms of the story card uh, out, which I don't have out yet. And then uh, you place your starting figurines where it tells you to, which is the Crossroads Camp, which is right there. And then any face up icons right here. This one has the robot icon right here, so you need to put a robot icon there. We have a super mutant brute right here. We'll talk about the cards as we come to it. Now, because the because my table isn't too large and we have limited room, we have over here kind of like the side area, which will probably be more central when you play with your friends. Uh, you have the store, which is in the bottom area the, uh, with those four face up cards with the caps. Uh, you have your pile of caps. You have the pile of special tokens. You have the creature cards and so forth. In each game, there are two factions vying for control. The card that shows you how to set up the map on the other side has the two factions. And the object of the game is to have the appropriate number of influence points before uh, any faction can go from the top here down to the bottom. This is the starting story card or encounter card according to the map setup page. 
Players will typically have two different ways to complete a quest according to this gray area. This is one of the most important parts of the game and the way to quote unquote win the game because completing these story quests will sometimes grant influence points which you need to obtain before a faction gets to the red area. Whenever a quest is completed, one or two new quests replace it. So as you can see in the case of this card here, if you complete step one, which is kill a suspected synth that no one will miss to find out the truth, uh, you will open up stories, uh, story parts of stage 15 and 134. If someone completes uh, the second part, number two, instead, you will open up story card 16 and story card 67. In this specific game, the Vault Dweller will start first. And what they'll do is they'll review what quest objectives they have. They'll review the items they can possibly purchase. They'll review their gear that they start off with and the options that they have. Now, each player has six different types of actions and they can do a total of two actions. They can either explore, which is to reveal an adjacent face down map tile, they can move, they can quest, which is completing one of the available quests, they can encounter, where if they're on a certain spot, they can turn over a card and it gives them various multiple choice options, they can fight an enemy on a, a space, or they can camp to recover uh, hit points. One of the first actions of this player will be to explore one of the unexplored areas. Each tile is divided into spaces denoted by the white lines. The player needs to be in a space adjacent to one of the tiles they're going to explore. The tile is flipped, and if there are any enemy icons on it, an enemy spawns in the appropriate area. So in this situation here, if we just remove this, the Vault Dweller right here, he, the space that he's on is adjacent to this, and this tile right here. But looking at the Brotherhood Outcast right here, he is only adjacent to this tile right here. He is not adjacent to this tile right here as per the lines. So right now, this is the start of the game and there aren't too many options. So what the Vault Dweller player is going to do is they're going to explore this map tile right here. You flip it over and you always have to make sure the tile arrow points up and then you do what the tile says. So this tile has a skull symbol, meaning that you draw a skull symbol enemy and place it face up. So this is the raider camp and uh, what spawns is a bounty hunter. So once it's revealed and the enemies are placed, uh, one thing of note is that the enemy is considered active because they're face up. If they are face down, like so, they're considered inactive. And inactive enemies do not move or attack and cannot be attacked by players. The player's second action is to move. The move action gives two movement points so uh, they can move between two different spaces. It's worth noting that you can spend an action to move, move one spot, commit another action, such as fighting an enemy, and after combat, continue using the second movement point. Uh, you'll notice that there are spaces such as here with the red outline. There will be spaces that have red outline and one that, ones that have green outlines. When you want to move into a spot with red outlines, you need to have two movement points available. If you move into a spot with a green area, that means you're taking rad damage. As we said, the Vault Dweller character is going to move. They've decided to move into this spot for one point and into this spot here for the second point. 
they've now used up their second action, so they can't fight the, the bounty hunter on this turn. Now that the Vault Dweller player has taken their turn, it's now the Brotherhood Outcast's turn. Now, one thing of note, what is special about the Brotherhood Outcast is his beginning card starts with Power Armor. Power Armor will reduce uh, damage that he takes, but one of the special things is that when he use, performs a movement action, you gain one movement point instead of two. So basically, he will move a lot slower than any other player. So on his turn, he is going to explore the adjacent tile, which appears to be a super duper mart. And once again, we will grab a random skull enemy, which ends up being a looter. And for his second action, he's going to move into the same spot as the looter. That is his second action. So uh, the round is complete. So what will happen is we will draw from the agenda cards denoted by the thumbs up. And this will determine what happens next. So this is the card, and, as, and, and basically what we're looking at is the bottom right icons. This tells us what spawns and what moves and what activates. So in this case, any shield icons are gonna move, which in this case uh, represents the uh, Institute. But we, ha we do have one right here, a shield icon right here, and um, these enemies will typically move to the closest player. So it'll move there. It can't cross any unexplored tiles as far as I've read. The uh, second icon is a Deathclaw icon. There are none on the board. And the uh, third one is a robot. And we do have a robot right up here at the CIT ruins. And it doesn't really seem like it's any closer, maybe this would be considered a little closer to any player. Once that has resolved, we then go to the Vault Dweller's turn again. Now here's the interesting part about Fallout that I really like. The, it's the Vault Dweller's turn, and they have two choices. You know, you, you read the beginning part, which says, many dangers lurk in the in this new wasteland ahead of you. But the one you have heard the most about is the dreaded synth. S said to look, sound, and smell just like humans, they are robots who have infiltrated the very society of the Commonwealth. And you have two choices. To one, kill a suspected synth that no one will miss to find out the truth, basically telling you, you have to kill one of the creatures with the skull icon, which is what sp has spawned both times. We had the Bounty Hunter, where the Vault Dweller is, and we have the Looter, where the uh, Brotherhood Outcast player is. And if they uh, do complete this quest, what happens is you get the rewards uh, denoted right here in this uh, tan, or I guess gold area. Wow. And the icons all have their own meaning. So the shield means that, um, if you remember, the tracker which tracks the how much power each faction has you know the railroad and the institute uh, the shield or the institute will gain power uh, by one basically uh, the player will get two loot cards denoted by the uh, loot symbol there and uh, it'll open up the story cards of 15 and 34 and this card will be trashed so that other players cannot gain access to the reward. So it's kind of like a race to finishing quests. Um, a player could choose instead to go to Diamond City. It says, this all sounds a bit overblown. Head to Diamond City to discreetly dig up some information. So um, doing so, it helps out the railroad instead. Once again, you get two loot. You open up stories 16 and 67 instead of 15 and 134. 
and uh, you add a special card to a special area, which we won't really talk too much about, and then you get rid of this card as well. So right now, as it looks, it is really convenient to just attack those, those, um, those suspected synths. But maybe you might be playing more as a role player. So maybe you want to help out the railroad or so maybe you'll want your, to make your way to Diamond City. I'm gonna play the Vault Dweller like a role player would. Uh, I'm gonna play the Brotherhood Outcast as a metagamer. Basically, we're here to win as soon as possible. So the Vault Dweller is like, okay, uh, I don't want to really kill anyone. I want to make my way to uh, Diamond City and help out the railroad. Something that's important of note is that actually, when I look at the Vault Dweller player's uh, agenda card, which is the one card that they get at the start, it says, it has the star indicating that they want to be pro-railroad. It says, for each space, uh, that the railroad has power more than the Institute, you get one influence. So the more they help the railroad, the more points they're gonna have, influence points, which they need to win. So they actually don't want to really help the uh, Institute with this specific card. Now, there are cards in the deck which will be the opposite, where you wanna help out the Institute instead. The other player could have uh, the, that, that, that opposite card. They might have the same type of card where they want to help out the railroad as well, and you will never know unless they somehow blab. So I guess this is the second thing you have, to, you have to think of. You have to look at the agenda cards and figure out how you're going to get influence points. So this player is going to make their way to Diamond City, which is over here to com hopefully complete the story quest, but we never know because the Brotherhood Outcast player, we don't know what he's gonna do, but there's, there's possibly a high likelihood that he's gonna attack that looter on his next turn. So as we talked about, we're gonna play the Vault Dweller now, or his first action will be to move. So he gets two uh, movement points. So he'll go here and then here. His second action point will be to explore. So he's going to explore this tile here, which ends up being the Red Rocket Station. Once again, we look at the, the tile, making sure that it's pointed face up. And then we, according to the tile, we have to draw a skull enemy. It'll be face up and it'll be a ra Raider Psycho. So that is the end of the Vault Dweller's turn. And now it is the uh, Brotherhood player turn. So let's look at his uh, secret agenda card. And it's called One of a Kind. And basically it says that you get an additional influence if you have exactly six special tokens, which we'll talk about momentarily. It says if you have um, all seven special tokens, then you get two uh, influence points. So the, uh, as we talked about, the Brotherhood Outcast wants, just wants to win. He wants to win as soon as possible. So he's on top of the uh, looter enemy. So this is combat. So we're gonna look at the enemy card for the looter. Basically it tells you it's a level one creature um, and you'll get one experience when you defeat it. It requires you to roll uh, a, a, a set of dice that requires you to get uh, at least one dice that ha that shows legs. If you defeat the looter, you'll get one reward. If you fail to defeat the looter, he will deal one damage per uh, miss, which we'll talk about momentarily, and uh, it will run away. Basically, it will turn inactive, flipping it over. Once again, you won't be able to attack it. So what the player does is they roll all their dice, hoping that they get a dice result that shows feet. So, this, so these are the results that we have right here. So the top dice, uh, we hit the arms. 
we did get one leg hit and actually a second leg hit. Now, the thing is, um, so we have defeated the looter, but the looter has done uh, three hits to us, denoted by the kind of the asterisk on the dice. So the top dice, he hits you once here, and on the bottom right dice, he hits you twice. Damage is calculated by their level. So uh, there are three hits, each doing one damage each. So the Brotherhood Outcast would typically take three damage. So the good thing about the Brotherhood Outcast is that their starting item or apparel is the power armor and denoted by the shield on the left hand side. That means that he gets to negate two hits every combat as long as he has it equipped. So although according to the dice, he got hit three times, the, his power armor stops two of the hits, so he actually only takes one damage. And what will happen is on his, he'll then take a look at his character sheet or his character card, and he's gonna move the red peg to the left by one. Then he's going to move his peg to the right to the next spot that has a token letter in there. In this case, it's the I for one experience. As we discussed, the looter in the bottom right has the icon of the uh, treasure sack. And basically the player gets to draw one. And in this situation, let's zoom in a little bit. He gets a fistful of caps. So he immediately discards this card and he gains three caps for a total of six right now. So the looter has been defeated by the Brotherhood player. What happens is the token goes away. The player gets the experience. He takes any damage. He gets any loot. And um, at this point, you also maybe check the story card. So as we talked about, kill any skull creature, which was that looter. And what happens is the, the Institute gains one power and actually he'll get two more loot and we're going to put up uh, stories 15, 34 and we're going to get rid of this card right here. So as you can see, the power of the Institute has gotten stronger. The player also gets two loot. In this case, we got Raider Armor worth three caps, denoted by the top right. It's an apparel. You can only have one apparel unless it says otherwise. Uh, it has a star for the shield. During a fight with an enemy that has a gun symbol, this is one, which is not too bad. And then uh, he got a companion, which is Hancock, which is very cool. Uh, basically, it tells you that exhaust to move an enemy within two spaces of you into your space and fight it. If that enemy is not killed during that fight, discard this card. If you have a P, keep this companion when it unexhausts. So that's a whole lot of words. Uh, basically what, it's, what Hancock is doing is that he's aggroing enemies. So in the case where you're uh, racing to fight a certain type of enemy and you can't reach it in time, you can exhaust a companion or an item, meaning that you're gonna turn it sideways to denote that it's exhausted and you'll use their ability, which causes enemies to move uh, within two spaces of you. And that does not count as an action. Uh, when you rest, you will unexhaust cards. Basically, you, like in magic, you uh, untap the card. But Fallout has a special mechanic in that uh, if you don't have certain items or skills or specials, then when you unexhaust or when you camp, you don't get that card back. So, as we can see here, it says, if you have P, which is perception, keep this companion when it unexhausts. And what it means that if you don't have perception when you go to camp, then 
you have to get rid of this companion. So the player has a spot for companions, which he'll put underneath his card. And the Raider armor, he doesn't like it very much, so he'll keep it in his inventory, which I believe is uh, five cards maximum. And as stated before, there are two new story cards on the board. There's uh, Resonance. Uh, basically what it says is, you tear the person apart, but they look to be flesh and blood, messy. Among their effects, however, is a transponder marked with the Vitruvian, with Vitruvian man, the words, the Institute, and coordinates to the old ruins of the Commonwealth Institute of Technology. And now there's two new uh, quest objectives, which you can pursue either one. Either you can follow the coordinates and explore the CIT ruins to find the Institute, which will then help the Institute some more, or you have heard only bad things about the Institute. A diamond city, caps may quickly get you the information you need. So basically telling you to go to Diamond City, you'll need four caps, and it helps out the railroad instead. As you can see, there are different rewards. Uh, one will give you three caps. It opens up different stories, and then you get rid of this card. Or the bottom reward says you get two loot and uh, two story, and you trash the card. The second story card that opened up is uh, Flesh and Bone. The locals are in an uproar. A young girl named Olivia has been run out of her home for being a synth. She says that if someone could just find her sister, she can prove false these ridiculous claims that she is some kind of robot. And what happens is you add 135. So what that means is there is a card in the deck numbered 135 that we're going to add to a specific deck, which the host can, can deal with. For those wondering, it, this is card 135. On the back, it has this icon here, which is kind of like ruins. There will be a deck like this. And basically what it says is that you take this card and you take the, and you, and you take the number of players. So there's two players. We're going to take these top three cards and we're going to shuffle them. Then we're going to put it at the top of that deck. This will come into play a little bit later. Going back to this card here, it says um, there is something fishy here. Interrogate Olivia. You have to complete a quest at any bunker symbol, which there is in Diamond City. If we look right here. So that symbol right here is a bunker symbol. So what the card is telling you, when you get to that bunker, which is Diamond City, you, your, and your action is the complete quest, uh, you will do a skill test. Uh, basically what, will, what it'll do is that it will give you a influence point you open up another story, stage 137, and you'll get rid of this card. And uh, the second option is go looking for her missing sister. Encounter any ruins until you find Olivia's sister. And uh, you'll get an influence point for completing that. Open up stage 136, and you'll get rid of this card. So as you can see, the longer the game is played, more options are, are opening up to the players. So going back to the game, the Brotherhood player has defeated the looter, gained experience, gained loot, opened up story. Uh, their second action is, I don't know, I like, we wanna win. And this guy doesn't have a specific faction-based influence po influence gaining um, bonus so and he doesn't know what the vault dweller w wanted uh, you might be able to tell from their body language or what they say what agenda card they might have so you might want to pay attention to that but we'll pretend everything's equal and he doesn't notice that 
and maybe he's going to, we're going for maybe loot. So let's actually try to get to Diamond City since he does have um, money and maybe he can complete more than one thing at a time. So his second action is to move. Uh, unlike all other players, he only gets one movement point. So he'll move forward right here. That is the end of the round. And once again, we will draw from the agenda deck to determine what happens. And one thing that I forgot was that whenever you defeat uh, an enemy, a new enemy replaces it on the specific space, uh, but it is inactive. And that's important because this is the next card. Uh, star symbol, so if there's any star enemies, which would in this case be the railroad, which there aren't any on the board, there's only the shield symbol. Uh, we would move those, but we don't have any. Uh, the super mutant enemies move, and we do in the bottom right or yeah, the bottom right, we have that super mutant brute, and they're gonna move closer to any, any enemies. Move right here. And then we have the skull symbol, which have been these raiders. Now, this is interesting. Um, what happens is any active enemies that are the, have the skull are going to move towards uh, players they only move once one spot so so let's let's talk about the uh, Raider psycho in the bottom right here he's going to actually move into the same spot as the Brotherhood player because the space is adjacent right down here now the bounty hunter is a little bit different so what's special about the bounty hunter is that He's level two. You have to defeat him by taking out his arms or his legs, and you'll need uh, two dice results showing that. And then you do get one loot. You'll get two experience if you defeat him. Now, when he moves, uh, he has a, a gun symbol, meaning that when he is adjacent, in a, in, when he's in an adjacent space to your character, uh, he can attack you when it's his turn. So in this situation, the bounty hunter's right here. He will move into this space here. Now he can attack this turn, but if the tr Vault Dweller player hasn't moved next turn and the bounty hunter gets to move again, he will actually attack the Vault Dweller. And what that means is, is basically you just initiate combat. But because he has the gun symbol, it will add one additional uh, hit to the dice result. So if, if say he only rolled, or you, your player only rolls one of these dice with the hit symbol, he will actually have hit you twice. And because of its level, he's doing two damage per hit symbol. So he could do four damage to you. But the bounty hunter is just moving closer to the Vault Dweller right now. And once the active icons have been moved, then you look at the inactive icons, which as we can see right here, we have an inactive raider uh, enemy. Because the card has that symbol, that means that it activates. Now, this is an interesting card uh, or token. Let's take a little closer look at it. It has in the bottom right, kind of like a lightning or an up arrow symbol in the bottom right in the yellow area. What that means is if it moves into an area or is revealed and a player is on that same space, uh, combat is, is uh, initiated right away. But as we can see here, there's no one in the uh, super duper march specific space, so nothing happens. He just has activated. Next turn, if a skull agenda card is revealed, then he will move towards uh, enemies. And if he ends up being on the same spot, combat is, in, in, is initiated immediately. 
So if neither of these two players move in the next turn, there's a very high chance that they're both going to be attacked. And actually, um, since we're talking about it, the Raider Psycho in the bottom left here actually is going to initiate combat with the Brotherhood Outcast right away. So let's do that. So all the Brotherhood Outpost player has to do is roll some dice. Let's uh, move this a little closer so you can see. So remember, level two enemy, you need to get chest and leg hits. And let's see what we got. Ooh, very nice, in a way. So what we have right here is, we have two chest hits and one head hit. Uh, this is good because you got the necessary amount of hits, uh, chest hits, and two uh, denoted by the vault number right there. So uh, you've defeated the Raider Psycho, but you have to calculate damage first. So normally you would take th three hits, each doing two damage. But remember, the Brotherhood uh, character has that armor, which reduces two hits. So he's only, he's only technically been hit once, but it still does two damage. So I'm going to reduce his health by two, and now he's down to 13. The second thing is, he does get two experience, so I'm going to move experience peg. And this is an interesting, import, or an important step as well that we're gonna talk about. So this is what his character board looks, right, looks like right now. He's taken three damage, uh, one the first turn, two this turn, so it has brought his health down to 13. Uh, he gained one experience on that first round, so we moved the gray peg from the first position over here, and we moved it to the first uh, face-up or filled-in letter, special letter here. So in this case, he gains two experience. So what happens is he gains one experience, which brings him back to the front. And whenever that happens, you draw from the pile of special tokens, which we have in this case to the left, and he'll pick two at random. In this case, they drew strength and intelligence. Now, as you can see, he already has intelligence. So he could take the, uh, the strength and that will help him in uh, certain situations. There are certain cards that will um, let him reroll his dice, or maybe it'll allow him to uh, keep his uh, cards that he exhausts. Um, if he, he can take the eye, and what will happen is he will be able to draw one of those perks. Uh, so these are the perk cards, and he will get to choose from random one of the intelligence perks. In Fallout, there's, in, or in this Fallout, there's only two perks per characteristic. So these two, he could pick, he could pick this. And what happens is he'll get this one-time perk, which says, uh, gun nut, discard at a bunker to gain a weapon item from the shop or from any discard pile. So that's not, that's not bad at all. But I think what he's going to do, this player, is uh, they're gonna go for the strength so that uh, we can get maybe better rolls, taking less damage, thus surviving longer. But we've only done the one experience. Now, when it comes to doing the second experience, instead of going from taking the gray peg and going to the eye, he has to go to the next available slot that he's, that he's added a letter to. So in this case, it goes to the S. The next time he gains experience, he'll go to the I again. If he gains one more experience, it'll go back to this spot and he'll repeat that process by taking two uh, special tokens at random and choosing between one or the other and whether that gives him uh, another special, I guess, point or he can choose one of the perks. So that enemy is eliminated and we will replace the uh, tile right here with another raider.
but once again, inactive. So uh, that was the end of just the computer's turn, I guess you can, you can call it. It is going to be the Vault Dweller's turn again. Now he sees the uh, Brotherhood player getting pretty far ahead. So we need to take a look at what options that he, he can do. He can try to complete some quests. He can try to defeat some monsters. But once again, we are trying to, we're trying to get points by helping out the railroad. And we are trying to be a role player here. So what he can do is he can go to Diamond City, spend four caps, and then help out the railroad. But in this situation, he doesn't have four caps. He only has three caps, so that doesn't really help him. He can try to gain influence points by doing that uh, flesh and bone quest. Uh, once again, uh, you want to go to any uh, bunker and do a challenge. There is Diamond City where he can do that. Or go to a ruins, which uh, there is the Red Rocket Station right here, and do an encounter. So I th think that's a that's something he can do, and I'm making sure that he has the spaces that he can do it. So uh, the Vault Dweller is going to use his first action to move. So he gets two movement points, unlike the Brotherhood Outcast. So he's going to go here, one, and that is adjacent. So he'll go two to the Red Rocket Station. We're going to use the second action as an encounter. He's going to go to a Ruins. And if you remember, when we added the Flesh and Bone quest, our event or encounter, uh, we added a card to this deck and we shuffled the top three. So one of these three cards is going to be the part that allows us to find Olivia's sister. So basically what you do is when the Vault Dweller player wants to do an encounter, the opposite player, so the Brotherhood player, will draw the top card here and he's going to read it. And um, let me see if we can get you see. And basically what it says is, you hear nothing but your own footsteps as you walk through the ruins. It's calm and quiet. And basically that is what the, per the Brotherhood player will read out. And then he's going to say, okay, Vault Dweller, what do you want to do? Do you want to hack into an old register? You're going to need to get three successes and if you have an eye, you can do one reroll of any amount of dice, or you can search for useful equipment. And um, it, it, it's harder because you need four successes, and you can reroll if you have um, perception or luck. Now, the Brotherhood player doesn't tell you any of this, any of the succeed or fail parts right now. And then we have to talk about success and failure. So a lot of the a lot of the game in Fallout is double use. So as we can see in the dice here, um, if it has that asterisk or the hit symbol, that is considered a success. So this is considered one success. This is considered zero success. And this is considered two successes. Uh, a dice will have either zero, one, or two successes. There's no threes, and um, the odds of getting the uh, two success is looks like one in six, but that's on three dice. And um, the odds of getting no hits is uh, two in six. The Vault Dweller, now four is kind of hard. Four is hard. Four successes is not the easiest to get, but as we talked about, um, or one thing that we, we may not know is that the Vault Dweller actually starts off with the Luck Special. So uh, he could select the Search for Useful Equipment and re-roll his dice or any amount of dice once. But um, this is maybe a conservative player and they're just gonna try to hack into an old register and try to get three successes. So let's, ooh, the person's lucky. So as you can see from the dice, three hits, meaning three successes. And a 
according to the card, you needed three successes. And what happens is, uh, succeed, the cap, or sorry, the register pops open and it says ruins caps. So what that means is uh, you look at the number over here, or you look at the number of the encounter. So in this case is Diamond City, over on the left hand side, which we can't really see is the red rocket station, which is two. So Diamond City four, and if we can maybe move it, it's a two right there. So what it means is um, the Vault Dweller player is gonna get two caps, which is great. When that encounter is completed, it goes to the bottom of the pile. Now, unfortunately, that was not the encounter that you needed to complete Flesh and Bone. It would tell you on the card. Uh, so that is that player's turn. But otherwise, it's, it's good because now it opens up the ability to, he can do that again on his next turn or he can he now has the money to go to Diamond City uh, that will complete the Resonance quest. And remember, uh, you go to Diamond City, you use an action to complete the quest, and you spend four caps, which he now has. He has um, five caps. And what that will do is that will give him, that will move forward the power of the railroad. And once again, from his hidden agenda, that is something that he wants to do. For, every, for each space that the railroad has advanced farther than the Institute, you gain a influence point. So now it's the Brotherhood player's turn. Lots of different options. I think before we were going to go to Diamond City, uh, there was the option of completing a quest there. There was an option of spending four caps to move the other quest. But actually now, now that that has been done, I think what the Brotherhood player wants to do is he's going to use his first action to move onto the Super Duper Mart space. There is a Raider Psycho here that because it has the arrow symbol in the bottom right, it means that the Raider Psycho immediately attacks or they initiate combat. So he doesn't have to spend an action to fight it. So we're gonna try to fight the Raider Psycho. Let's see what we have. We have to, we have to get two successful dice results plus uh, either a chest or legs. Let's see what we're gonna get. Oh, very lucky today. Very lucky today. So uh, we got the two chest hits per the two right or per the two dice. We did get a headshot, but it doesn't really do anything. The player does take three hits, but remember the power armor does reduce the uh, the hits by two. So he actually took only really one dice of damage. In this case, is two damage. So once again, let's calculate damage first. So he goes down from. 13 health to 11 health. Then we are going to gain two experience. So if we move the peg from the S to the I for intelligence, and then once again, it goes to the start again. So the Brotherhood player gets to choose or gets, gets to take two random uh, special tokens. And in this case, it's once again, it's going to be um, strength and charisma. So I think in this case, what we're gonna do is he'll take a perk since he's, feel, he's feeling confident because the vault player is not doing very well. So he'll take a strength perk just to say, hey, look what I got. And uh, let's find them. Okay, so he has, so he doesn't know which, which perk he's gonna get. He'll take this one. And this one says armorer. Discard at a bunker symbol tile to gain an apparel item from the shop or from any discard pile. So that's not the greatest, but yeah, that's, that's not the greatest right now because the shop doesn't really have anything amazing. Uh, it currently has a hazmat suit, which is armor, Nick Valentine, which is a companion, a plasma gun, and a rataway. So 
that wasn't the best, but still, better than nothing. And then, he does get the one loot from the pile, which in this case is... In this case, it is water. During your turn, you may discard this card to recover five hit points, then suffer one rads. So, as we talked about, if your health and your rads uh, ever meet, then you die. You lose any, any, any of your inventory cards, you keep anything equipped, uh, you move your health back to max, and you put your character back in this starting area at the crossroads over here. So this is not bad because uh, since he's been fighting a lot, he's been taking a lot of damage. So we're just gonna hold on to this for now. He's, he, he's, not, he's not dying. We'll get rid of the token and once again, as always, we're going to replace it with an inactive raider in that same spot because there is a symbol right here. Now, for his second action, he's going to explore or encounter just like how the Vault Dweller did last time. We're going to draw an encounter card from the encounter pile. So in this case, this guy's actually very lucky. Uh, he drew the flesh and bone uh, associated story quest or encounter. So basically what it says is, a couple of landmarks catch your eye as you approach the area. This is the place where that girl Olivia said her sister was last seen. Looks dangerous, but you could go poking around to see if there's any truth to it. Once again, since the Brotherhood player stepped on this and, and is encountering it. The Vault Dweller player takes this card and is reading it to the Brotherhood player. And the Vault Dweller player says, okay, what do you want to do? Are you going to look for Olivia's sister or are you going to ignore it and search for the loot? So once again, you're not telling them what the results will be. And this one, um, one thing of note is that looking for Olivia's sister doesn't require a skill check. Uh, if you want to just ignore and search for loot, you have to get three successes. And if you have uh, perception, which unfortunately the player doesn't have, you can get a reroll. I think this player wants to search for L Olivia. And it says, you see the body of a girl lying under an overhang. When you turn it over, you see the body doesn't just have a familial resemblance to Olivia. It is Olivia. The girl you spoke to was a synth who replaced her. Suddenly you see movement. She sent you here as a trap. So now you complete the flesh and bone quest, draw and fight a uh, insect monster, and then you get rid of this card. So let's handle one step at a time. Uh, we're gonna complete flesh and bone. So completing flesh and bone, what it's saying is that, so that's the that's this number two part. So go looking for her missing sister. So he, so this player gets an um, agenda card, which uh, counts as influence points plus any bonuses at the back. So we're gonna draw that. And this is the Brotherhood Outcast. So this is the agenda card that, that they got as a reward. So let's see what it says. For each space, the Institute has advanced farther than the railroad, you get plus one influence. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good uh, because the Institute is already ahead of the uh, railroad. So in this case, uh, the Brotherhood player has one point for the first agenda card. This is the second. And because the railroad, or sorry, the Institute is um, ahead of the railroad by one, that's an, an, one more point. So that's three points compared to the vault player, which has technically only one point, their initial point. So that player will place that face down in their character area. And then we're, uh, as, as per the bottom of the card, uh, we're going to get st story 136 and get rid of this card. So according to the encounter card, we draw one of the insect 
creatures. It will be face up on the same spot. And uh, let's see, does it say to fight immediately? Let's just double check and fight, yes. So he has to fight again. So this is a sting wing. So let's take a look at what a sting wing does. So as we can see, a sting wing is a pretty basic enemy. Um, it is a level two creature, meaning that's going to do two damage per hit. Uh, it requires headshots and body shots. Uh, it doesn't do anything special. So knock on wood, let's hope for some good rolls. And once again, uh, the Brotherhood player is very lucky. So we did get two body shots, which just, which kills the Stingwing. It would normally do two hits of damage per the left and right rice, or per the left and right dice. But with the armor that the Brotherhood player has, it eliminates that, so he has taken no damage this turn. Just like any other fight, uh, the player is going to gain two experience. So um, off to the side, I'm going to move the peg to the first part which is S and the second experience will bring it to the I. So the player has not gained any experience. As you can see the more special points that you have the more um, the, the, hard, the, the longer it'll take for you to level up. But so so a strategy might be if you're lucky enough to get the same um, it, so a strategy might be if you can get a perk take the perk. So that is the experience, no damage. The Stingwing has been eliminated. Uh, it didn't have any special things like no special loot, no special damage, so we don't have to worry about that. And then um, 136 is revealed. It says duped. It turns out the people were right. Olivia has been replaced by a murderous synth. They say she was last seen passing through the Ashbury neighborhood on her way out into the wasteland. Time to track her down. So you have two options. Ask around Ashbury and try to talk to her. So you go, you got to find Ashbury Road, which I believe is a green area uh, tile. So as, as we can see, green tiles and red tiles. Red tiles indicate that there's going to be stronger monsters that spawn uh, and then green tiles. And um, I guess over time, if you play it a lot, you'll kind of memorize this and know, okay, Ash Ashbury, Ashbury Road is in a, a green tile or it's a red tile. I haven't played this enough and I wasn't reading the, the uh, tiles, so I don't know where, where it is, which is good. Um, so you can ask around Ashbury or we can track her through the wasteland and take her out. So uh, that is something. So you want to go to the raider camp. Hmm, that would be probably easier. So this is the easier option. Basically it says go to the raider camp, which as we can see is up there to the top left and uh, do, an, in, do uh, an encounter and, uh, or do a complete quest. And that will cause you to draw and fight a random um, raider enemy. That will give you another influence point and then you get rid of this card. And then technically this storyline is done. If you like story, then you might try to find Ashbury Road. You might try to do the skill test for successes. You get rerolls on endurance and charisma. You'll get three experience. You'll further the story of this mini story here and then you'll get rid of, then you'll get rid of this card as well. But that is the end of the Brotherhood's uh, turn. And uh, we will see what the enemies are going to do right now. So guys, we've been doing this video for a very long time. Uh, per the rest of the videos on my channel, you'll see that I normally don't upload videos this long, mostly due to the fact that it takes forever to edit and then upload to YouTube. Thank you very much for staying for the ride. I'm going to stop the video here, but if you're having as much fun as I am, check the part two video, which will have another few more turns. 
I unfortunately do not get to do a few things in this video, including camping or buying something from the store, as everything we did today was totally random. I hope I was able to give you a good idea of what the game looks like, how to set it up, and how it plays. Tell me what you think in the comments, whether you've decided to get the game or any interesting stories playing it. Once again, I appreciate you joining me today on Night Knowledge. I'll see you next time.